When I was 24, I decided to take a solo road trip across the country. It was the summer after I finished college, and I wanted to relax before diving into work life. I studied on the East Coast and had friends living out West, so this trip was the perfect excuse to visit them. Some parts were fun, but overall, the drive was pretty dull. Having someone with me would have made it better, but no one else was free to join, so I went alone. Being a millennial, I opted for Airbnb instead of staying in hotels or motels. One of my stops was in a tiny town in Montana, about 40 minutes off the main highway. I booked a place there from my phone during a gas stop the day before, planning to spend just one night and hit the road early the next morning. The area didn't have much to see, so it was just a pit stop for rest. I got to the house late in the evening. It was already dark when I parked my car on the gravel road in front of the house. It was a small two-story place with a field across the road and a few other houses nearby. I rented the ground floor, knowing that the upstairs unit had a separate entrance next to mine. When I got out of the car, I walked up to the front door. The porch light was on, so I knew I was at the right place. There were no other cars around, so I figured I was the only guest. It seemed unlikely anyone would be there without a car. At the door, I looked for a lockbox or something for the key, but realized I hadn't been given a code. Just as I was about to call the host, I found an old key under the doormat. It felt odd, but I picked it up and let myself in. The place was okay for one night, a bit warm but comfortable, with plenty of space. After an hour or so, I decided to go to bed. I brushed my teeth and settled into one of the twin beds in the only bedroom. Just as I was about to drift off, I heard footsteps from upstairs. I was surprised because I hadn't heard anything earlier, and like I said, there were no other cars. The footsteps sounded like two people moving around and then coming down the stairs. I didn't feel scared at that point, thinking they were just other guests. I lay there for a few minutes, feeling a bit uneasy, when I heard a noise outside my window. It was like a faint tapping or maybe a creak. Then, suddenly, I heard a sharp metallic sound, like a lock sliding into place. I had no idea what that was. It creeped me out enough to get up and get dressed. I crept through the living room, clutching one of my bags tightly. I thought about making a dash for my car, but when I peeked out the front window, I froze. There was someone standing right next to it, barely visible in the dim light. I couldn't see his face clearly because it was dark and my car was a bit far. I could definitely make out a man's shape and he seemed to be smoking a cigarette. Going out the front door was not an option, so I snuck out the side and hid behind a tree. I pulled out my phone and frantically called the owner. I needed help fast and thought the police would take too long. The owner hadn't mentioned where he lived, but I had no other choice, so I dialed his number. Even though it was late, he answered. I whispered that someone was breaking into the house and told him the upstairs guests were trying to rob me. I glanced back at my car and saw the man still standing there, holding his phone to his ear and looking around. Then I turned my attention back to my call. The owner said, I'm coming. Where are you hiding? I'll save you. Something about the way he said that gave me chills. I didn't trust him. I thought he might be in on it. I didn't reply and hung up. As soon as I did, I looked back at the man by my car and he lowered his phone at the same time. That confirmed my suspicions. My host was in on it. Stuck behind that tree, I had no idea what to do. I couldn't go back inside, and I definitely couldn't walk anywhere without being seen. I finally dialed 911, but the police said it would take over half an hour to get there. I waited in the dark for almost 45 minutes, and nobody came. Eventually, I looked back at my car and saw the man was gone. I didn't know if he had left for good or if he was coming back. Either way, I sprinted to my car, got in, and drove off, leaving one of my bags behind. I called the police again, but didn't want to stay in that town any longer than necessary so I don't know what happened next. However, Airbnb reimbursed me for the stay and my lost bag. A week later, I checked the site to see if the house was still listed, but it had been removed. I guess that's a good sign. But it would have been better if the host was behind bars. Me and my mom wanted to find a vacation rental for New Year's. While searching, we found this house near the beach, and the pictures made it look really nice and modern. It had three bedrooms and two bathrooms, so we decided to rent it. When we got there, we met the host, 
and he seemed a bit odd. He gave us a tour of the place, but it didn't look like the one in the photos. I thought we might be at the wrong address, but it matched the one the guy gave us. There was also a strange smell in the air. At the end of the tour, I noticed another room that he didn't show us. He told us not to go in there and that it was off limits. His serious and hurried tone made me uneasy. To make it worse, he seemed to be flirting with my mom, which was really gross. After the host left, I took note of the car he drove off in, and we tried to get on with our day. A few hours later, I was heading to one of the bedrooms and felt a need to check the closed-off room. I saw a light was on in there, and I knew it hadn't been on before. This made me worried, so I told my dad. When he went to check, the light was off again. This really freaked me out, and I had a hard time falling asleep after that. Just as I was about to doze off, I saw a shadowy figure dart across the yard. It totally freaked me out. I sat there for what felt like forever, but eventually, I managed to fall asleep. When I woke up, it was daylight, and I headed to the living room. I glanced outside and saw the host slipping into that off-limits room. Trying to act casual, I peeked through another window and noticed his car parked across the street. That's when it hit me. The host was probably staying in the garage while renting the house to us. I shared my thoughts with my parents, and they decided to confront the host. When they did, they came running back not long after. They burst into the house, telling us to pack up fast and get to the car. We did exactly that, and within minutes, we were speeding away. I asked my mom what happened, and she said the guy had a gun. I'm so relieved we got out in time. I don't know what he was planning, but I'm just glad we're safe now. A few years ago, my buddy James and I went on a trip to Louisiana. He was really into using Airbnb and said he used it whenever he traveled. He suggested we use it to find our place for the trip. I wasn't familiar with it, but I figured why not, and let him handle the booking. James found a charming old house we could rent for a great price. It looked vintage, but well kept from the photos. When we got there, we met the owner, a friendly woman named Lisa. She handed us the key and gave us a quick rundown of the place before leaving. We went inside, unpacked, and then watched some TV. James set up his laptop to catch up on a bit of work. We had plans for the next day, but nothing specific for that night, so we just relaxed. As it got late, we decided to call it a night. The house had two bedrooms on one floor. We each went to our rooms and went to sleep. The next morning we noticed the living room lights were on. I was pretty sure I had turned them off before bed, about 80% sure. But we had to leave quickly, so I brushed it off. When we came back later, we saw our stuff was all over the floor. Our belongings were scattered everywhere. Now we knew something was up. I called Lisa to let her know. When she picked up, I told her about our things being messed with and the light being on. She said she didn't know what to say since only she and we had keys to the house, and she never had any issues before. We decided to search the house ourselves. It wasn't very big, just a couple of bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen, and a living room. We checked the closets but found nothing unusual. Then we noticed an attic hatch at the end of the hallway near our bedrooms. I decided to check it out. Grabbing a chair, I climbed up and opened the hatch. It was pitch dark inside, looking like just a crawl space. As my eyes adjusted, I suddenly saw movement. Squinting, I saw a man crawling towards me quickly. Panicked, I jumped down and slammed the hatch shut. The man tried to force it open, but I held it tight. James looked shocked. I told him there was a man up there, and he quickly pulled out his phone to call the police. While James was on the phone, I struggled to keep the hatch closed. The man was strong, and I knew I couldn't hold on much longer. Then he started banging on the hatch, making it even harder to hold. I yelled for James to help. He grabbed the hatch too, but the man yanked it open with a final strong pull, sending us both crashing down. The man landed on top of us. There was a chaotic struggle. I remember him being filthy and shoving me to the floor. James tried to intervene but wasn't much help. The man pushed him aside and bolted out the door. The police arrived about 10 minutes later, but the man was long gone by then. We gave them all the details, but they never found him as far as I know. I think he might have been a homeless guy living up there, but I can't be sure. 
I'm just grateful we weren't hurt. He seemed desperate to escape, but the whole experience has put me off Airbnb for good. This took place in 2006 when I was 16, in Scotland. I'm a girl, by the way. Back then, I was deep into my emo phase. Every weekend, I'd hang out in the city center with other emo kids. I had to take a bus from my home to downtown each time. It was a Saturday, and I can't recall if it was late autumn or if I just stayed out longer than usual, but it was dark when I boarded the bus home. As I sat there, I remembered needing something from the local corner shop before heading home. So, I decided to get off the bus a stop earlier. The shop was about a 10 minute walk from my house. To give you an idea of the area, my home was in a nice quiet suburban neighborhood. But just a few blocks away, you'd find yourself in a sketchy part of town. The shop was in that rough area. I got off the bus and crossed the street to walk to the shop. I always felt a bit out of place in that rough area, decked out in my emo clothes and makeup because it was where all the tough guys hung out. Emo kids were easy targets for them to mock. As I walked towards the shop, a feeling of unease washed over me. I noticed a guy leaning against the wall outside, staring at me. I felt nervous but figured he might just shout something rude or laugh at me. He didn't. I went into the shop, bought what I needed, and headed out. As I walked up the road towards home, I realized someone was following me. I glanced back and saw it was the same guy from outside the shop. To test if he was really following me, I crossed to the other side of the street where there were no houses, just a school. He crossed the street too. I walked a bit further, then crossed back. He did the same. By now, I was sure he was following me. I picked up my pace and crossed the street again, needing to be on the other side to reach my neighborhood. He followed. Just as we neared my neighborhood, I don't know why, but I decided to turn around and confront him. I asked him why he was tailing me, but he denied it right away. I pointed out that I saw him outside the shop and how he crossed the street every time I did. He kept denying it. Up close I could tell he was either drunk or high, maybe both. He looked way older than me, probably in his late 30s. Then he started asking me to go to a party with him at his friend's place. I asked where the party was, and it was in an even rougher part of town, further than the shop I'd just left. I told him no, and mentioned I was 16, hoping he'd back off knowing I was just a kid. But even after knowing my age, he kept pushing for me to join him at this party. I made it clear I wasn't interested, and just wanted to get home. I stayed calm trying not to provoke him, even though he was being super creepy. I said something like, I just want to go home without you following me. He told me to go ahead, that he wasn't following me. So, I started walking again. But after a few steps, I noticed he was following me again. This time, I panicked and started running as fast as I could and he began chasing me. The problem was, my house was in a straight line from where we were, so if I ran home, he'd see where I lived. I sprinted past my house and turned a corner, heading to a neighbor's place who were also family friends. Their door wasn't visible from the street, so I managed to lose him. Luckily my neighbor answered the door and let me in. They called my mom and the police. My mom came over right away. We never heard back from the police about whether they caught the guy. I often think about what could have happened if he had caught me or if I had gone to that party. It's terrifying to even imagine. After that, I never got off the bus at that stop again. A few weeks back, I took a trip to a rented cabin out in a remote forest area. I planned to go hiking with some friends, and was set to stay there for just two nights before starting the week-long trek. When I arrived and saw the cabin, I felt good about it. It was quite secluded, just a basic wooden cabin, which I liked. I parked my car around the side and carried my stuff inside. The cabin was small and not very fancy, but it was what I expected for the price I paid. That night, I went straight to bed, eager to wake up early the next day. My plan was to check out the first part of the trail that my friends would join me on the following day. I needed to make sure it was clear and not too muddy from recent rains. If it was too muddy, we'd have to pick a different trail. 
I made some coffee and relaxed until early afternoon before heading out. I walked to the main road and then a half mile to the trailhead. It looked fine, so I didn't hike more than a short distance before turning back. I was only gone for an hour, but as I returned to the path leading to the cabin, I saw a truck parked right out front. I sped up, feeling uneasy. When I reached the cabin, I went straight to the truck window, but it was empty. I looked around, but saw no one. There was no one in the distance, no one at the door. Where could they be? I cautiously approached the front door, noticing it was still locked. Inside, it was clear that no one had been there, which was my biggest worry. After checking all the rooms, I opened the rental app and messaged the host, asking if he or someone else was supposed to be here. While waiting for a reply, I checked the windows again, still seeing nothing. The fact that I couldn't see anyone or where they could have gone made it even creepier. It was just woods all around, with this lone cabin stuck in the middle. Hours ticked by as I waited for a response, keeping an eye out for anyone returning to their truck. As the sun began to set, I felt more and more uneasy. Then, around 8 p.m., I finally got a text back. No one else should be there. Honestly, I wasn't shocked by the response. Deep down, I knew it. Still, I had hoped for a different answer. I couldn't shake the feeling of being unsafe, so I decided to pack up and leave. As I started gathering my stuff, I suddenly heard footsteps coming from the front porch. I froze, listening as they approached the door. No knock followed. I stood there, staring at the door for what felt like forever before I cautiously peeked out. A tall man stood on the doorstep, facing away from the door, gazing towards the truck. A shiver ran down my spine as I watched him stand motionless. The thought that he might not be alone terrified me. I took a few steps back, aiming to slip into the other room and call 911. But on the third step, a floorboard creaked loudly. Immediately, the man shuffled outside, and the doorknob started shaking violently. I sprinted to the bedroom and locked the door, dialing 911 as the man outside continued to rattle the door and bang on it before suddenly bolting off the porch. A second later, I heard the truck drive away. The police arrived quickly, but they weren't much help. I left the cabin that night and booked a hotel room instead. The man was never caught, and knowing he was still out there somewhere unnerved me. I couldn't stop thinking about where he had been all that time. Was he hiding in the woods or lurking around the cabin? After that night, I don't think I'll be renting another remote cabin anytime soon. Female, 48 I found myself in an Airbnb after a tough day at my cousin's memorial service. I had traveled 10 hours to this new state, feeling out of place. The service was painfully quiet, and very few words were exchanged among attendees. Some gave speeches, but they were hard to listen to, stirring up memories of how much she meant to me. I realized that without her, I had lost a dear companion, maybe the only genuine friend I ever had. Once I arrived at the Airbnb, I planned to stay just one night before heading back home. I debated splitting the five-hour drive into two parts, resting halfway at a hotel or another Airbnb. The app was new to me, making the process confusing and stressful. Settling in for the night, I sat there reflecting on my life. Thoughts about my own mortality crept in. What if I didn't make it to the next day? What would people say about me at my funeral? It wasn't a dark place I was in, just contemplative. These thoughts made me value life more reminding me to treat others kindly since any moment could be our last. Deciding to turn in early at 7.30 p.m., I didn't feel like eating or distracting myself with TV or social media. After brushing my teeth and washing my face, I climbed into bed. As soon as I lay down, a phone started ringing in another room. It wasn't my cell. This was a loud, old-fashioned landline ring. It had to be connected to the property somehow. But why was there a landline in this Airbnb? Guests aren't supposed to use the homeowner's phone, right? The ringing continued, filling the empty house with an unsettling noise. I'd booked two nights because it was the minimum stay, but intended only to use one. Reluctantly, I got out of bed, my curiosity battling with my unease. Should I answer the phone? Who could it be? It's not my house, it's not my problem, I thought, 
trying to ignore the phone. I paced around the bedroom, feeling lost and exhausted from the day. Eventually, I climbed back into bed, trying to shake off the weird feeling. It had been a long, draining, and heartbreaking day. I turned off the lights and closed my eyes, hoping for some rest. Just then the phone started ringing again. This time, I was irritated enough to answer it. I got out of bed and made my way to the phone. When I picked it up, I could hear someone breathing on the other end. Confused and a bit scared, I said, Hello? Hello? Can anyone hear me? Who is this? There was no response, just the sound of breathing. It was creepy, and whoever was on the other end clearly didn't want to talk. I hung up and went back to bed, but now I was even more unsettled. I didn't feel safe sleeping in this Airbnb anymore. To distract myself, I turned on my phone and started scrolling through social media. Time passed quickly, and before I knew it, it was 9.30 p.m. The phone hadn't rung again, and I was starting to relax a bit, almost forgetting about the strange calls. I turned off my phone and set it down on the floor near my bags. I hadn't unpacked much since I was only staying one night. Most of my stuff, like my meds, food, and other essentials, stayed in the car. Just as I was beginning to drift off, the phone rang for the third time. How odd, I thought. It had been hours since the last call, and now it was ringing again. I jumped out of bed and hurried to the phone, not even bothering to turn on the light. In my rush, I nearly ran into the wall but managed to sidestep just in time. I picked up the receiver, and a woman's voice came through, though I couldn't make out the words. It sounded like she was asking for help. Unsure of what to do, I just said, please stop calling me, and hung up. Back in bed, I felt uneasy, unable to sleep for the rest of the night. Morning came, and I quickly packed my things, grabbed a quick bite, and left the Airbnb. The phone didn't ring again. After a grueling 12-hour journey, I finally made it home, utterly drained. The past few days had been a nightmare. My cousin's funeral, the bizarre phone calls, it all felt so surreal. Two months later, I got a call from the local police department where my cousin's funeral had been held. The Airbnb host had been arrested for attacking his wife. The woman who called me was his wife. She thought the Airbnb was where her husband's brother was staying and tried to reach out for help during one of the nights her husband was abusing her. Realizing the calls weren't a prank but a cry for help chilled me to the bone. I couldn't have done anything in the moment, but knowing the truth made the whole experience much more disturbing. The police asked me a few questions about the calls, what she said, how long they lasted, and how many times she called. They got my details from the Airbnb app since I had paid the host directly. The encounter left me rattled, knowing there was a serious and dark story behind those calls. The incident still haunts me, a grim reminder of the horrifying events that unfolded without my knowing. Last year, my friends Tom, Mike, and Steve thought it would be cool to spend a weekend in the mountains of Kentucky. We found this remote cabin on Airbnb, buried deep in the woods. It seemed like the perfect secluded spot, exactly what we needed. There was no Wi-Fi and we didn't expect any cell signal. We were all excited about the idea of unplugging for a bit. Tom borrowed his dad's old truck for the trip. That thing was ancient, but it was sturdy enough for our trip. Definitely better than my tiny Prius for this kind of adventure. The drive took about six hours from our town and the views along the way were amazing. As we drove up the winding mountain road, the scenery just got better and better. We arrived around five in the evening with plenty of sunlight left. After unpacking, we decided to explore the area before it got dark. Not far from the cabin, hidden among the trees, we found an old rusty truck. It looked like it had been there for ages, the forest slowly swallowing it. None of us felt like trekking through the brush to check it out closely, so we left it alone for now. By the time it got dark, we were back at the cabin. We lit a fire and spent the night chatting and having a few drinks. The cabin was pretty simple, just a single room on the main floor with a bed in one corner, a small kitchen in another, and a living area taking up the rest of the space. There was a loft with two twin beds where Tom and I slept. 
Mike got the bed downstairs, and Steve ended up on the couch. Tom and I couldn't sleep right away, so we whispered to each other for a while. The loft was open to the rest of the cabin, so we tried to be quiet. Around 2 a.m. we heard something outside. It sounded like footsteps circling the cabin. We immediately thought of a bear or some wild animal, given where we were. We tried looking out the window, but it was pitch black. Deciding it was best not to investigate, we lay back down, trying to ignore the sounds. Eventually they stopped, and we fell asleep. The next day we went hiking and explored more of the area. The natural beauty was incredible, and we soaked it all in. As evening approached, we built a fire in the pit in front of the cabin. The night was chilly, and we crowded around the fire for warmth. Suddenly we heard rustling in the bushes again. We tensed up, bracing ourselves for a bear to appear. Then Steve jumped, swearing he saw a person walk by. I spun around, scanning the darkness, but saw nothing. It was hard to believe he'd seen anything in the pitch black, but we didn't want to take any chances. Bears are no joke, and it was freezing, so we headed inside. When we went to bed, I couldn't sleep again, but Tom dozed off instantly. I lay awake for hours when I heard Steve get up from the couch downstairs. He went out the front door, and I figured he was going to pee. Minutes later, he burst back in, flipping on the lights. Steve was frantic, yelling that we needed to leave immediately. I was already up, and it didn't take long for the others to wake up too. Steve had gone outside with his flashlight and spotted a man lurking around the cabin. He was sure the man was still out there. None of us wanted to venture out to check, so we spent the night huddled in the living room, waiting for dawn. At the first light, we cautiously stepped outside, I walked around the cabin but didn't see anything unusual. Our footprints were everywhere, making it hard to tell if anyone else had been there. Then, Tom called me over to his truck. The driver's side door was covered in fresh scratches that hadn't been there before. It looked like someone had tried to carve something into the paint, but the message was too messy to read. It was clear, though, that someone had been there, and their intentions weren't friendly. Up until that point, I was skeptical about whether we had a visitor at all. We called the police once we got to the main highway, but they never followed up. Our description of the man was too vague, but I still thought it was worth checking the area. Our host didn't say much when we called him. He probably thought it was just an animal and didn't believe us. I couldn't blame him since I would have thought the same. On the drive back, I remembered the old truck we saw on the first day. I wondered if the man we saw had been living there. That old thing couldn't be drivable, but he might have been using it for shelter. The thought was creepy. Maybe he was there the whole time we walked by. My first time using an Airbnb was back in the summer of 2021. I was traveling with my buddy Jake. We needed a place to crash, so Jake checked out Airbnb and found a spot that was affordable and in a decent area. It was a little house in a bustling neighborhood just outside of the city. From the outside, the house seemed ordinary, but inside it was quite cozy. Unfortunately, we only had access to the basement part of the house. I had assumed we'd have the entire place, but there were others staying upstairs and we were just in the basement. This annoyed me, and it bugged Jake too, but there wasn't much we could do about it now. The basement had a small living room, a tiny kitchen, a bathroom, and a bedroom. We arrived in the evening, so we grabbed some food and then headed to bed. Since there was only one bedroom, Jake took the bed, and I crashed on the couch in the living room area. We turned off all the lights, and I was trying to sleep when I thought I heard someone coming down the stairs. I couldn't understand why anyone would be coming down here. I didn't expect them to come all the way, but they did. They reached the door, and I saw it open. It was pitch dark, but I could make out a shadowy figure in the doorway. They seemed to be scanning the room. When I saw them step inside, I shut my eyes and pretended to be asleep. I was scared out of my mind. I could barely hear her steps, and after a few moments, I opened my eyes again. It seemed like a woman standing near the bedroom door across the room. I watched her try to open it, but it was locked. Then she fished a key out of her pocket. That's when I spoke up. I asked what she was doing. The moment I said that, her head snapped towards me, and then she bolted out of the room and back up the stairs. I couldn't believe how fast she moved, and now I was seriously creeped out. Why would she do that? 
I went over to the main door leading to the stairs and locked it. Finally, I managed to fall asleep again. I planned to tell Jake about this in the morning so we could leave and report whoever that woman was. But for now, I was exhausted and figured she wouldn't come back. Looking back, I can't believe I thought that. Probably just the exhaustion from the long day of travel. I woke up a bit later to the sound of the door opening. That's when it hit me. If she had a key to the bedroom, she'd have one for the other doors too. I saw her enter the room again. This time she wasn't heading for the bedroom, she was coming towards me. When she got about ten feet away, I jumped up. I dashed to Jake's bedroom, and the woman took off up the stairs again. I banged on Jake's door as hard as I could. Eventually, he woke up, and we both quickly packed our things and got out of there. Last spring, five friends and I decided to go on a getaway. We're all in our mid-twenties, and since there were six of us, we booked a spacious Airbnb house. It was a beautiful place with enough room for everyone. Though it had only three bedrooms, each one could hold two people so we had to share. Upstairs, there were three bedrooms and a bathroom. I bunked with Emma in one room, Rachel and Megan shared another, and the last room was for Sarah and Kate. The ground floor had a huge kitchen, a living area, and an extra bedroom. The place felt very open and modern. Our host, named James, was known for owning several properties in the region, all listed on Airbnb. We reserved the house for a week and were thrilled to find it exactly like the pictures when we arrived. Once we got there, we chilled for a bit before heading into town for the evening. We had a blast and came back exhausted, crashing into our beds almost immediately. The next morning, we grabbed breakfast at a local cafe. While chatting, Rachel mentioned she heard some strange sounds in her room as she tried to sleep. Megan, who shared the room with her, said she dozed off quickly but also recalled hearing the noises, thinking it was Rachel. We joked about the place being haunted or an intruder sneaking in. Rachel insisted she heard something but laughed along with the rest of us. We had another fun-filled day, exploring the town and local parks, staying busy until late. We returned around midnight, tired again, and went straight to our rooms. Each room had two beds. I got into mine, and Emma settled into hers. We turned off the lights and tried to sleep. Not long after the lights went out, I heard a sound. At first, I ignored it, but then I heard it again. A soft brushing noise on the floor. It was hard to pinpoint where it came from, but it was definitely inside the room. The room was pitch dark, and I knew it couldn't be Emma because she hadn't moved from her bed. I sat up and asked Emma what the noise was. She replied she didn't know and laughed nervously. We lay there quietly for a bit. Everything seemed normal again. After a few minutes, I tried to sleep, but then I heard the sound once more. It was still hard to figure out where it was coming from. Suddenly, Emma's phone flashlight turned on, and she screamed. She called my name, and I asked what was happening. She pointed under my bed. I jumped up, and we both ran to the door. I glanced back and saw a man's face staring at us from under the bed. He looked like he was about to get up, so we shut the door and hurried to wake the others. We rushed into Rachel and Megan's room, waking them up, and then we all moved to Sarah and Kate's room. But while we were in there, we heard the door down the hall start to open. We decided to stay put and call the police. All six of us huddled in the bedroom, wanting to leave, but knowing the man was still out there. We heard footsteps, and then a knock on our door. Megan shouted that we'd called the cops, and they were on their way. The man responded, apologizing and claiming it was all a misunderstanding. He said he was James, the Airbnb owner, and asked us to let him in. We refused, and eventually, we heard him walk away. A few minutes later, the police arrived. James was nowhere to be seen, but since we were in his house, we had to explain everything to the officers and give them his information. We decided to spend the rest of our trip at a hotel. The next day, the police found James. It's creepy to think he might have been spying on us the whole time we were there. As people poured into the stadium, it got super crowded. I started feeling a bit squeezed in, but I couldn't help getting pumped up as we found our spots, ready for some afternoon football action. When the game started, the crowd went wild. Folks were yelling, 
clapping, and hollering like crazy. The vibe was electric, and I got caught up in all the excitement. But in the middle of all the cheering fans, one guy stood out. This weird dude was sitting a few rows in front of us. He kind of blended in, wearing jeans and a beat-up bear's hoodie. Something about him just seemed off, though, like he was unpredictable or something. While everyone around him went nuts over every touchdown or interception, this guy just sat there like a statue. It was like he couldn't care less about the game. He was by himself, and honestly gave me the creeps. I couldn't stop wondering what was going on in his head. I got curious and leaned over to my little sister, whispering, Hey, you see that dude over there? He's been sitting like a rock the whole game. I guess it's kind of normal to watch without getting too excited. Maybe he was bored or just super chill. It was just weird because he barely moved a muscle the whole time and seemed to be alone, like I said. My sister glanced at the guy and just shrugged. Maybe he's just really into the game. Some people don't get all loud and crazy like others do. I nodded, but I still felt uneasy about the guy. As the game went on, the Bears had a rough time. Fumbles, missed throws, and penalties. The crowd started getting annoyed and disappointed, but the weird guy still fascinated me. While others booed and got mad, he stayed totally calm. His face was all pale, and he looked like some emotionless robot. In the last quarter, with the Bears losing, something strange happened. The guy pulled out a little notebook from his pocket. He started flipping through it and running his fingers over the pages. I couldn't figure out what he was doing. Then he took out a pocket knife and began carving into the notebook. My heart was racing as the Bears made an awesome comeback. I tried not to focus on the guy anymore, and the game was almost over. I got up to hit the bathroom real quick before it ended, so I wouldn't have to deal with the crazy crowd all rushing to pee at once. I've made that mistake before, trust me. As soon as I got up and started walking up the steps, I noticed the dude turned his whole body and stared at me. Then he stood up and followed me. I probably should have gone back to tell my mom, but for some dumb reason, I didn't. Can't really explain why. I walked into the bathroom with him right behind me. I thought it'd be packed since we were at a big college basketball game, you know? Nope. The only other person there was a little kid, and he bolted as soon as I walked in. Now it was just me and this weird guy. I went to pee, feeling his eyes on my back the whole time. I was freaking out inside but tried to act cool. Didn't want him to know I was scared. I turned around, not even bothering to wash my hands honestly. He was blocking the door with this creepy smile. I froze. Hey kid, wanna make 50 bucks? It'll only take a minute, he said, grabbing his crotch. That's when I booked it for the exit, not caring if he tried to grab me. It was my last shot to get out of there. I told my family what happened and my mom called the cops. They couldn't do much, because the security cameras couldn't get a clear shot of the guy. Later that night, I couldn't sleep, which wasn't too weird for me. But something freaky did happen. The last time I rolled over in bed, trying to get comfy, I saw a dark shape outside my window. I jumped up and ran out screaming for my family to wake up. My mom checked all over, inside and out, but found nothing. I swear I wasn't dreaming or anything. I know nobody believes my story and it sucks, especially because I stay up most nights waiting for him to come back. As far as I know, he hasn't, but that doesn't mean he won't. It's been like five years now, and I still think about that creep every single night. I reached my last stop before my final destination the next day. It was late and I was completely worn out from driving for days. I grabbed my small backpack and went into my Airbnb for the night. It was just some random house off the main road, and since it was only for one night, I hadn't looked too much into it. I just needed a bed to crash in for eight hours. As soon as I walked in, I noticed a really bad smell. It wasn't exactly alarming, but it wasn't pleasant either. It smelled like maybe a dead animal under the house or mold in the walls. I did a quick check around, peeking into the bedroom and bathroom. The smell was much stronger in the bedroom than in the living room, so I decided to set up in the living room instead and sleep on the couch. I took a blanket from one of the chairs and spread it out. As I did this, a loud thump echoed through the walls. 
I was more confused than scared, thinking it was too loud to be just the house settling, but it was hard to tell where the noise came from. I walked down the hallway, poking my head into each room to see if anything was wrong. Everything looked fine, and I wasn't sure what to look for anyway. I figured it was nothing to worry about for the short time I'd be staying. I went back to the couch and continued setting it up, then lay down and pulled out my phone to plan the next few days. A few minutes after that first thump, there was another one. It sounded almost exactly the same, just a single loud thump through the walls. I got up again and walked down the hallway, checking the rooms more thoroughly this time. I turned on the lights and inspected the walls and ceiling, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. By now, I was trying to convince myself that maybe a tree branch was hitting the roof in the wind, but even that seemed unlikely. I returned to the couch, reminding myself that I was only staying for one night, and whatever the issue was, it wasn't my problem. I turned off the lights, lay down, and quickly fell asleep. The night was quiet, and I was so tired that I had no trouble sleeping. But how I woke up was strange. I was only half awake, my eyes still closed. I might not have remembered it if it hadn't been for what happened next. A deep sense of dread filled my gut as I opened my eyes. A man was standing right above me, staring into my eyes. My body went rigid in that moment, but it only lasted a split second before the man bolted from beside the couch and out the front door. I jumped up and ran to see where he went, but he vanished into the trees. I shut the door, then went to get my phone, but something caught my eye at the end of the hallway. A folding ladder was hanging down from the ceiling, leading up to an attic. I didn't waste any time calling for help. As you might have guessed, the man had been hiding in the attic. There wasn't much up there to show he'd been there for more than a day or two. He was probably using the Airbnb as a place to crash, but his behavior made the whole situation really creepy. If I hadn't woken up, who knows what could have happened. When I was about 10, my family decided to go on a trip. My dad, not the best at picking vacation spots, chose a place far from any city. He fancied himself as an outdoorsman, though he really wasn't. He thought he knew everything about surviving in nature from watching YouTube and survival shows. But things never went smoothly. We always ended up stuck in the middle of nowhere with no friends, no internet, and no store nearby, which made my mom super mad. I'm not sure why she put up with it for so long. Every trip left us frustrated and on edge. This one time, around eight years ago, my dad rented an Airbnb. I was busy with my game console and barely noticed when we arrived. I was shocked to find us in a busy city, not in some remote forest. My dad had booked an apartment on the 10th floor of a tall building, a surprise since he usually picked isolated places. This apartment wasn't fancy, just one of the cheaper options, but it was in a building with over 80 floors. Our family wasn't wealthy, but we managed to go on vacations once or twice a year. After we lugged our stuff inside, I realized how noisy the place was. There were always people crowding the elevators, and sometimes they were so packed we had to use the stairs. On our first day, we decided to explore the city. It was Denver, and I had never been there before. The city felt overwhelming, and I began to think maybe my dad had a point about nature being better. The calm of the outdoors, the fresh air, and the peace were starting to sound good. Out in nature, we only heard birds, rustling leaves, and the occasional animal. Here, it was a sensory overload. My ears, nose, and eyes were bombarded with chaos. Cars honking, people shouting, and even a weird guy dancing with one sock and no pants. It was a lot to take in, and I could see my dad wasn't enjoying it either. Turns out, this trip was my mom's idea. She finally got my dad to agree since we had done his nature trips for the last six years. After a few hours exploring Denver, we headed back to our apartment to decide on dinner, take showers, and change. It was scorching hot, with humidity around 90%. My dad kept complaining about it for an hour after we got back. When I tried to take a shower, I noticed it wasn't working right. The water stayed ice cold, making me yelp and almost slip. I called my dad to fix it. He messed with it for a while and finally got it working. The temperature control was broken, and he had to twist it the opposite way and pull it out a bit. I almost slipped and hurt myself, but once my dad fixed the shower, I continued washing up. We all got clean and ready for the night, 
The plan was to find a nice place for dinner, but that turned out to be harder than expected. It was a busy Saturday night, and every restaurant we tried was packed. People were lining up just to make reservations. By the time we reached the fourth place, a big Japanese restaurant with a flag out front, my parents were clearly frustrated. We ended up at a Mexican spot, but I hated the food. It was way too spicy for me, even though I ordered something mild from the kids' menu. I've never been a fan of spicy food. It just burns my tongue and ruins the taste. While we were at the restaurant, I noticed a man sitting alone in the corner. Everyone else was with someone, either a couple or with family and friends. He was the only one by himself, which seemed odd to me. Since my mom didn't let us bring our game consoles, we had nothing to do but stare at the menu or doodle with the crayons they provided. My mom got mad at us for drawing on the menus, saying we were ruining them. During the couple of hours we spent there, I kept an eye on the lone man. He didn't order any food, just sipped what looked like coffee or tea. I was young, so I couldn't really tell what it was. But it struck me as weird that he was just sitting there without eating. He stayed there the entire time we did. After we finished, my parents paid the bill, and we left. We took a taxi back to the Airbnb since it was dark out. When we got back, the shower was still acting up. My younger brother, who had refused to shower earlier, now decided he wanted one. He always changed his mind, and it drove us all crazy. My dad went in to fix it again, using the same trick as before, but this time it stayed ice cold. He figured it might be an issue with the building's boilers and messaged the Airbnb host. They replied saying it was a problem with the plumbing that happened every few months. My dad read the message out loud, and my mom got really upset, saying they had paid a lot for a place that didn't work right. Suddenly, there was a loud knock on the door. I could hear a man shouting from the other side. My parents went to check it out, and when they opened the door, I couldn't see who it was from my angle. They stepped back, and the man walked into our apartment. I thought it might be the owner or a maintenance guy, but then I recognized him. It was the same guy from the Mexican restaurant. My heart raced and chills ran down my spine. I looked around, trying to find my brother, feeling a sudden wave of fear like something bad was about to happen. This guy had been tailing us the whole time. My parents didn't remember seeing him at the restaurant, either because their memory was bad or they just hadn't noticed him tucked away in the corner. I was the only one who saw him, and he caught my attention right away. He was wearing overalls, looking like a typical maintenance guy. After he left, I asked my dad if that was the owner, but apparently, he was just the maintenance guy for the building. I wasn't sure if I should tell my dad about seeing him at the restaurant. He might think I was imagining things, like when I had imaginary friends until I was seven. My parents were probably already regretting spending a lot of money on this trip, but it was too late. The guy fixed the shower, showing my brother how to handle it if it went cold again. My brother took a shower, and then we got ready for bed. I only told my brother about the guy, but he didn't care, because he hadn't seen him at the restaurant either. After our parents put us to bed, we stayed up for hours playing Nintendo under the covers. For some reason, our parents didn't let us bring our consoles to the restaurant, but they either forgot or decided to let us use them all night. We played until around 2 a.m., chatting with our friends online. I was about to fall asleep, barely able to keep my eyes open. Only real fans will remember the Nintendo DS, the live chats, and group chats. Those were the days. We kept our DS consoles long after they went out of style, while others had PSPs and tablets. Our parents didn't have much money, so splurging on the Airbnb was a big deal every year. It made sense why they were upset with how this trip was turning out, but it was about to get much worse. I turned off my DS, realizing my brother had fallen asleep with his still on. I took it from him, turned it off, and put both consoles on the bedside table. Then, I tried to sleep. It's hard to explain, but when I'm busy with something, I get sleepy. But when I actually try to sleep, I can't. I've had this problem since I was little, and I usually fixed it by listening to soft music all night. At 11 I didn't have an iPod or phone, just my Nintendo which couldn't play music. So, I just lay there until I eventually fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to a strange feeling. As I became more awake, I realized it felt like someone was tickling me. I started to laugh quietly, 
but I couldn't understand what was happening. It felt like I had a really funny dream. I've never laughed that hard before. My brother started to wake up, so I tried to stifle my laughter. Then, I saw someone at the end of my bed. The tickling was coming from my toes. I jumped up, terrified, and tried to kick the person. The figure stood up and stepped back. My brother, now awake, said, Dad, what are you doing? It was so dark, we could only see a broad-shouldered figure with short hair. As our eyes adjusted, we realized it wasn't our dad. The man leaped onto me, trying to cover my mouth. I screamed and bit his fingers. Our bedroom door flew open, and my dad stood there, frozen for a second before charging at the man. He grabbed the intruder by the hair and started beating him. My mom came in, screaming, and turned on the lights. My brother hid under the bed, terrified. I lay there, shocked by what had just happened. Security came and took the man away. It was the same guy from the restaurant, the supposed maintenance man. We didn't know if he was connected to the Airbnb host, but his behavior was suspicious. How did he know to follow us back? I was too young to notice. Either he followed us all the way, or he had something to do with the host. The police said he might have tapped my parents' phone, but that didn't make sense. How did he know to come in overalls? What happened to the real maintenance guy? It didn't add up, but for me, it was a real-life horror story. When I woke up and caught him, it seemed like he realized he had messed up, and his next move gave away his plans. About three years back, I purchased my dream home. At 35, I finally had enough saved to buy an off-grid house in the woods, spread across over 15 acres. The place had two separate structures, a main house and a smaller guest house. I moved into the main house and listed the guest house on Airbnb to help cover expenses. The driveway was long, with my home situated roughly a mile from the main road. The guest house was nearby but separated by a small grove, providing both me and my guests with some privacy. Both houses shared a clearing, surrounded by thick forest, with trails winding through it. Renting out the guest house was a breeze because the property was stunning. It wasn't hard to take some great pictures, and the place was booked most of the time during the first year. Usually my guests were couples or groups of friends on vacation. The guest house had two bedrooms and could comfortably sleep five, so single guests were rare. This story is about one of those uncommon instances. Jake, a young man in his early 20s, booked the place for three nights midweek. Since I was nearby, I didn't bother with an automated check-in system like many hosts do. I met him there and showed him around. Jake was very quiet, barely 19. He seemed withdrawn, and it was tough to get more than a few words out of him. Given that he was on vacation, I expected more enthusiasm, but it wasn't my place to pry, so I left him alone and went back to my house. The first night passed without any issues. I kept busy with my usual chores around the property and didn't hear a peep from Jake. But on the second day, something odd happened. I was working in my garden around noon, and I could see the guest house through the trees. There were three guys there, including Jake. I hadn't seen the other two arrive, and Jake hadn't mentioned any visitors. It felt strange, but as long as they weren't causing any trouble, I didn't see a reason to interfere. My policy allowed up to three guests for the standard rate, with additional charges for more people, so three was fine. Given that Jake had arrived alone, it made sense that he might have friends joining him later. One night, I stayed up late reading on my laptop. Around midnight, I decided to head to bed. After getting ready, I turned off the lights and lay down, but couldn't fall asleep. I got up and paced around my room. When I passed by my window, something outside caught my eye. I saw two lights moving through the forest on my property. It was too late for anyone to be out there, or so I thought. I knew there was a trail where I saw the lights, but it was late. It had to be my guests since my place was too remote for random strangers. It was odd they were out there, but not a big deal. They had permission to explore, after all. Maybe they thought the forest looked cool at night. I didn't know. Jake checked out alone the next morning. When I saw him off, I asked about his friends. 
He mumbled something I couldn't make out and said they left. He seemed surprised I knew about them, maybe hoping I hadn't noticed. When I went to check the guest house, it was spotless. Not a single dish in the sink, and only one bed looked slept in. I wondered if Jake's friends even stayed the night, and if not, why? After enough weird things, I decided to follow the path where I saw the lights. I knew the woods well, and was sure where to look. My first pass found nothing, but on the second try, I poked around the bushes next to the path. I found two large duffel bags hidden under some brush. Opening one, I saw a pile of bloody clothes and a gun. I didn't touch anything else and called the cops right away. My place turned into a crime scene within half an hour. Cops and investigators swarmed the property. I tried to stay out of their way, but it was hard to ignore. Of course, I gave them all the info on Jake, and they tracked him down. I didn't learn anything about the crime for almost a month, but eventually the details hit the news. Only then did I find out what those guys were doing on my property. They had committed an armed robbery in a town over three hours away in another state. Jake had rented the guest house to hide evidence. I guess they thought the remote location would keep them safe. That wasn't the case. My property is big, but not that big, and the bags were just off the trail, not hidden well. They would have been better off ditching the bags in some random woods with no trace of them. These guys weren't the smartest, and thankfully for everyone else, they're behind bars now. This happened a few summers back. My name is Carlos, and I was on vacation with my girlfriend Maria, headed to the East Coast. We spent hours online, hunting for the best places to stay. After a bunch of hotel searches, Maria suggested we check out Airbnb options. It didn't take long to find one that seemed perfect. We both agreed it was the best choice. A couple of weeks later, we arrived. Seeing it in person, it looked exactly like the photos. The neighborhood seemed pretty nice, and the house was fairly new with a small, neat yard. The house was cozy, just one bedroom, two bathrooms, a living room, dining room, and kitchen. The first day, we didn't spend much time at the house. We were out exploring nearby cities. Things got weird on the second night. It was late, probably around midnight, and Maria and I were getting ready for bed. I was in the bathroom brushing my teeth when I heard a noise from the hallway. I thought it was Maria. About ten seconds later, I walked into the bedroom and saw her already in bed. I asked if she had been in the hallway, and she said, No. It felt odd, but I brushed it off, thinking there must be a simple explanation. I got into bed and closed my eyes. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up. I sat up in bed. It was around 4 a.m., and Maria was still asleep. I wasn't sure what woke me, but I scanned the dark room. After about 30 seconds, I heard a noise from the kitchen area. It sounded like footsteps, but I couldn't tell where they were headed. The noise was brief, but I was now convinced someone was inside. I stayed still, listening, but heard nothing more. I wondered if I was just being paranoid. To be safe, I got out of bed and turned on the light. I reached the hallway and turned on that light too. Nothing seemed out of place. I didn't hear any more noises. Then, I moved into the living room and turned on those lights. From the living room, I could see most of the house. I checked every room, but there was no one there. No sign of an intruder. I went back to bed and eventually fell asleep. The next day was normal. We spent most of it out, enjoying vacation activities. That night, something similar happened again. This time, Maria woke me up, saying she heard something in the house. I got up, still half asleep, trying to figure out the noises. I didn't turn on the lights this time. I walked into the hallway looking around. I didn't expect to see anything, but then I noticed something. At the corner of the dining room, I saw a closet door slowly closing. I couldn't believe it. I didn't see anyone, but I definitely saw the door move. I might have seen an arm, but it was too dark to be sure. Maria had followed me out of the bedroom. I told her to go back inside and followed her. Once we were both in the bedroom, I locked the door. She suggested calling the police, so we did. They said they'd be there in 15 minutes. As we waited, we heard footsteps again. This time the steps were getting closer, stopping right outside our door. 
I yelled that we had called the police, but there was no response. After several tense minutes, we finally heard sirens. Only then did the footsteps retreat. When the police arrived, they searched the house and the area, but found no one. The front door was unlocked, suggesting whoever was there had left in a hurry. We didn't stay another night. We never found out who was in the house, but we were just glad to be safe. About three years ago, my husband and I decided to take a road trip down south. We were headed to Florida and thought driving would let us see some interesting spots along the way. To keep things on track, we chose to book Airbnbs ahead of time instead of hotels. We had used the app many times before and liked how it worked. On the first day of our journey, we drove for around nine hours, starting early through to the afternoon, or where we did our first Airbnb and got in touch with the host, Hawas and told our gentleman who turned his renovated cabin into an Airbnb. He could unlock the doors remotely. The Airbnb was an old-fashioned cabin near some woods and hills. It was somewhat secluded and offered a fantastic view, which is why we chose it. It was exactly as we imagined, very charming. Inside, it had modern updates but kept an old-timey vibe. There was a big kitchen, a cozy living room, and a bedroom. After getting there, we took a stroll around the property and then went inside to unpack a few things. While unpacking in the bedroom, we heard a noise from the kitchen. It sounded like footsteps on the wooden floor. I went to check it out, but when I got there, the room was empty. I found it odd because we were supposed to have the whole place to ourselves, and I didn't think anyone else would be there. We shrugged it off, and after finishing our unpacking, we headed into town to look around for a bit. We got back later that night, feeling pretty worn out. But as soon as we pulled up to the house, we saw that the light in the living room was on. The window had shades drawn, so we couldn't see inside, but it was clear the light was on. I was sure I had turned it off before we left. We sat in the car, staring at the window, thinking about the noises we heard earlier. Then, the shades moved for a second, and a man looked directly at us from inside. It definitely wasn't our host. The man stared at us for about five seconds before disappearing behind the shades again. We were really freaked out and didn't want to go inside. I called the Airbnb host to see if he knew what was going on. When I explained what we saw, he seemed shocked and asked me to describe the man. After I did, he said it sounded exactly like his son. Then he told us his son had died about 16 years ago and that we weren't the first guest to see him. That gave me chills. My husband and I decided to grab our stuff and leave. We spent the night in a hotel instead. I was heading back from my job late one cold, rainy night. I'd been working at the local 7-Eleven for a few months, trying to get my act together. Didn't have a car, but I did what I could. Sometimes a friend or family member would pick me up, but often I'd walk home. It was about a 20-minute walk if I took it slow, maybe 15 if I kept a good pace. I'm from Newark, New Jersey, and some parts of this city can be pretty dangerous. There are crimes like robbery, murder, and kidnappings that happen here often. To get home, I'd usually cut through a rough neighborhood. It was risky, but it cut the walk time in half compared to taking the long way, which I didn't want to do. The whole area was dangerous, so I figured it didn't make much difference. I'd seen some shady stuff there, but nothing that bothered me. Maybe I was naive, or maybe I just didn't care. But then things went south fast. A car sped past me, packed with guys of different races. There were white, black, and Hispanic guys in there. They didn't care about the stop signs, speeding by at least 25 miles over the limit. The car stank of weed, and the bass was so loud it made the ground vibrate. They drove past a few times, but the last time I almost got killed. I heard the car again, coming from my left, and got a bad feeling. I dove behind a bush, hoping they wouldn't see me. They drove by slowly, like they were looking for me. I figured one of them saw me go in that direction but didn't know exactly where I went. I was sure I was about to become another crime statistic. They were getting closer, and I feared one of them would spot me, but all I could do was hope. Suddenly I heard a shout. Over there! Look behind the bush! They drove up to where I was hiding in a stranger's yard, near the sidewalk. The driver slammed the brakes, and everyone in the car pointed guns at me. 
They had the doors open and guns aimed from the windows. I froze, convinced my life was over. There I was, in the middle of an unfamiliar neighborhood, with no way to defend myself, caught in the sights of this gang. Two had handguns, another had an AR-15, and the last one had a shotgun. It felt like they were trying to scare me, but I was terrified they'd actually kill me. It happened so quickly, probably only 10 seconds, but it felt like a full minute of waiting to die. They shouted at me, but I don't remember what they said, just that it was meant to intimidate me. And it worked. Then, just like that, they drove off, leaving me untouched. But I still had a mile to walk through that neighborhood, and I felt so exposed. The rain picked up, soaking me, but that was the least of my worries. I was scared they might come back and finish what they started. It seemed like a sick game to them, terrorizing me for fun. Almost getting killed for no reason is a terrifying thought. I was just minding my own business after a long 12-hour shift, heading home to rest. The next day, I quit my job. My boss understood. I didn't want to risk going through something like that ever again. I decided to take a little break and go on a vacation. I live in a flat, dull place, so I chose somewhere with mountains and forests. I picked Vermont, even though I only knew about the big towns there, which were pretty pricey. So I started looking for Airbnbs in smaller towns. There weren't many options in my budget, but I found one that seemed alright. I booked it and hit the road the next week, driving for hours to get there. After a long eight-hour drive, I arrived in the town where I'd be staying. Driving through it, I felt uneasy. I hadn't expected much, but this was even less than I'd imagined. The few houses lined a dark, empty street, with old power lines barely standing on the sides. At night, it almost looked abandoned. I hoped it would look better during the day, but this was my first impression. Luckily, I found the Airbnb easily enough turning into a gravel driveway that led to a small cul-de-sac with my Airbnb and four other tiny houses. I parked and got out, carrying my bags to the front door and heading inside. It was a small 500-square-foot place, but it was nicely set up. I dropped my stuff in the bedroom and went to the kitchen to fill my water bottle and relax before bed. As I stood at the counter, I heard a car coming down the gravel road outside. I walked to the window and saw headlights slowly pull into the cul-de-sac, stopping in front of the house next to mine. The car turned off and the headlights went out, but no one got out of the car. After a minute, I just shrugged and went back to the kitchen. It wasn't my business, and I didn't want them to see me watching. I sat down on a bar stool, pulled out my phone, and sent a few texts, letting my family know I'd arrived safely. After about 15 minutes, I decided to call it a night and headed to the bedroom. While unpacking and getting ready for bed, I heard a car door open and close outside, followed by footsteps. They seemed to come quite close, but I assumed they were just going to the house next door. The footsteps stopped suddenly, but I shrugged it off and climbed into bed. I fell asleep after about 30 minutes and didn't hear anything else. When I woke up I had no idea what time it was, but I felt really uneasy. The house was quiet, except for some light creaking. I sat up, peering through the dark room trying to figure out why I felt so strange. My eyes adjusted to the darkness, and then I saw it. A pair of eyes staring at me through the uncovered window. My heart leapt, and I froze. After a moment, the figure moved away from the window. I could barely hear their footsteps, and it didn't seem like they were leaving. I jumped out of bed and quickly started getting dressed. Suddenly, there was a noise outside the bedroom door. I stopped and listened as heavy footsteps moved away from the door and ran down the hallway. I didn't know what to do, so I just stood there, listening. The footsteps went from inside the house to the gravel path outside, and then I heard a car start and drive away. After a while, I cautiously opened the bedroom door and walked down the hallway. The door was wide open, and when the night was utterly quiet, I never heard the footsteps of the person at my window leaving, but it seemed like they were gone. I did what I could and reported it to the local police station about 20 minutes away, but they never followed up. I have no idea who it was, what they wanted, or why they broke in. I'm about to stick around to find out.
I've been working since I was pretty young. My first job was at a local diner, and then I moved on to Burger King, KFC, and McDonald's. I've always done jobs that others might look down on, but it never really bothered me. When I was younger, I didn't understand how judgmental people could be or how toxic the adult world was. I don't know where to begin with this story since the beginning is so tangled that I could add a lot and still not cover everything. Let's start with me. My name is Emma, I'm 23 now, and this happened a few years ago. I think I'm a cheerful, easygoing person. When I was younger, I didn't know what I wanted to be. Most of my friends had big dreams of being singers, models, actresses, hairstylists, the typical girl jobs. And the boys wanted to be policemen, firefighters, soldiers, millionaires, gang leaders, and so on. Then there was me, little Emma, lost in the diner, serving greasy bacon sandwiches to folks who were probably older than my grandparents. Once I realized that I definitely didn't want to work in a diner anymore, I applied to different places. Most of the jobs were still in fast food, like McDonald's or other nearby diners. My relationship with my parents was pretty good. They were supportive throughout my life. I thought it was time to move out, but I didn't go to college, so there was this gap in my life I needed to fill. I had never had a boyfriend until I was 19. Once I got my second job at McDonald's, I realized I enjoyed it more than the diner. There was a guy at McDonald's named Jake. Jake was quiet, tall, and I liked his style. He had a certain vibe that I found attractive. I wasn't confident enough to approach guys, but watching him made me want to try. I couldn't tell if he liked me, but I made sure to be around him, putting myself in situations where he could ask me out. One night, we were all stuck at work late, which should honestly be illegal. A kid spilled their drink at the back of the place. There were some seats near the edge, and a bunch of kids were having a birthday party. One of them thought it would be funny to pour soda on their head, and then they all started doing it with other drinks too. So, not only did we have to clean up the mess, but we also had to deal with the screaming kids and their angry parents. Even though it was chaotic, it still beat serving old folks greasy bacon sandwiches and getting weird looks from some of the older men. Here, I felt safer and more at ease. After cleaning up, we ended up staying about 40 minutes past our shift. Not getting paid for the extra time really annoyed me. Sam was mad too, it was obvious. He kept saying how unfair it was and probably illegal. I wasn't sure, but I figured the management would get away with it. As we were all leaving, Sam and I ended up walking out at the same time, not on purpose. I was putting on my coat in the staff room, and he was in the bathroom. As he came out, I was heading for the exit. We awkwardly ended up standing right next to each other, because the bathroom door is close to the restaurant exit. It was a tight squeeze, making things even more awkward. We started chatting. Sam mentioned he had to go to his aunt's birthday party, even though he didn't want to. His mom was making the whole family go. I laughed and thought it was cute. Then, out of nowhere, he asked for my number. I was really excited and caught off guard. I had no idea he liked me. I gave him my number, and he started texting me as soon as I got home. The funniest part was when he sent me a picture of him and his family at his aunt's house. Everyone looked so miserable. I sent back some laughing emojis and teased him a bit. I thought it was adorable. I could see a future with him. He was genuinely nice but not too much, which was perfect. We went on a few dates and within a few weeks we were calling each other boyfriend and girlfriend. He was a bit older than me, around 20 at that time. I can't recall his exact birthday since we're not together anymore. When we returned to work, things changed. Our co-workers could tell we were dating. We would hug and chat during breaks, which our manager didn't like. Our manager, Katie, was our age, which was odd to me since I thought managers needed more experience. I didn't get along with Katie at all. She was strict, bossy, and honestly, not nice to look at. I figured she took out her frustrations on everyone else. The team was good. We handled customers well and worked smoothly. But Katie always ruined the vibe. She'd make a big deal out of small things, like holding us back 40 minutes for kids spilling soda. She yelled at us, saying we should have enforced the rules and kicked them out. I thought that was extreme, but the saying goes, the manager is always right, unless it's about pay, then go for it. Katie never messed up my pay since it was automated. 
If she controlled it, she'd probably not pay me or delay it. Once, when I hugged Sam at work after we started dating, I noticed her attitude towards us changed. We were planning a trip to an Airbnb in a forest in Oregon. It seemed a bit creepy, but I liked the thrill and felt safe with Sam. We wanted a week off for the trip, thinking a couple of days wouldn't be worth it. When we told Katie about our plan, she became even meaner, targeting Sam and threatening our jobs. She claimed our relationship was a distraction, even though we barely interacted at work. During breaks, we'd hang out at the back where everyone smoked or relaxed. It was clear to me that Katie liked Sam, but I didn't care since he had no interest in her. Legally, she had to give us some time off, so she gave us four days instead of the six we requested. It was better than nothing. We booked the Airbnb for dates that allowed us to have a weekend off after the trip before starting work again on Monday. When we got to the Airbnb, it was disappointing. We were on a tight budget, so the room was tiny. We drove there in Sam's car, and he did most of the driving. It was only a few hours away. When we arrived, we were both pretty exhausted since we're not used to long drives. We decided to grab some food, and then just chill for the night. We planned to explore the forest in the following days, but we were too tired to start that night, so we went to bed early after some kissing and stuff. The Airbnb was a room inside someone's house. We had our own bathroom and a little kitchenette to the side. It wasn't great, but it was only 50 bucks a night, so we were okay with it. Being broke college dropouts meant we didn't have much cash. Our parents charged us 200 bucks a month for rent, which I thought was dumb. Even though my parents supported me a lot, that's the one thing I'd criticize. They didn't need the money, but said it was to prepare me for adult life. We woke up in the middle of the night to weird noises outside our door. At first, I thought it was the homeowners, maybe walking around, using the bathroom, or working a night shift. This is the downside of staying in an Airbnb that's part of someone's home. You can hear everything, and they can do whatever they want since it's their place. The noise was so loud it woke Sam up too. It sounded like banging or someone trying to knock something over. I decided to get up and look out the window. Something felt off. It wasn't the usual scenery I was used to. Back home, I knew exactly how everything looked outside my bedroom window, but here, it was different. When I looked out the window, I noticed Sam's car was missing. There was no sign of it anywhere. Then I thought, maybe he parked it further down the road, and I just didn't remember. I turned around and asked, Hey Sam, did you park the car on the other side of the house or this side? He rolled over, his long hair covering his face, mumbling something I couldn't understand because his hair muffled his voice. I told him to move it out of the way, and he finally spoke up. No, why? He asked. Well, your car's gone. His eyes shot open, filled with panic. Sam jumped out of bed and rushed to the window, letting out a loud, Oh, crap! We quickly got dressed and hurried downstairs. When we got there, we saw shattered glass all over the floor. We used our flashlight to follow the trail. It was obvious someone had stolen the car, but who? Sam and I decided to wake up the homeowners. They were just as surprised as we were. They claimed they had no cameras and didn't hear a thing, but we were woken up at 2.30 in the morning by the noise. Something didn't add up. I didn't want to accuse anyone without proof, but who would drive all the way out to the middle of nowhere in Montana to steal a car worth less than $300? It made no sense. Our vacation was ruined. We had to walk everywhere and spend a fortune on Uber. It was a nightmare. And even though the insurance covered the car, we realized how much we relied on having a vehicle for our daily lives. When we got back to work, Katie was as annoying as ever. I joked to Sam that maybe Katie had stolen our car, but it didn't seem likely. We hadn't told her exactly where we were going, just a rough idea. Katie wasn't smart enough to stalk us or find our exact location. We worked at McDonald's for another year or so until things fell apart. Sam cheated on me and I ended the relationship. It was heartbreaking because I really loved him. He was my first love, and seeing his car get stolen during our trip was something I never expected. We had a great first night, but after the car was stolen, Sam was too upset to enjoy the rest of the trip. We mostly stayed in, ate, went grocery shopping, and took long walks in the forest. Being in the forest was peaceful, a nice break from being bossed around by Katie. 
Now, I'm back in school, doing a master's degree. My parents pushed me into it, and even though I didn't want to go back, the fear of working in fast food forever got me there each morning. After we had been together for about eight months, my girlfriend and I decided to take a trip. We live in Texas, so there are many great spots to choose from. However, neither of us had a lot of cash at that time, and things can get pricey fast around here. That's why we were scouring Airbnb for a deal. Eventually, we settled on a place outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, and it looked like an amazing deal. It was a small cottage, but still plenty of room for us. The location was also pretty good since it was a short drive from the Grand Canyon and other nice places. The hotels in that area can get really expensive so it seemed like a fantastic find. It was about a 6 hour drive for us and we left around 10 am on a Saturday morning. We finally arrived in the early evening. The house itself looked fine, just like the pictures we'd seen online, but the neighborhood was a different story. It looked pretty run down. The nearby houses were either falling apart or seemed abandoned for years. As we drove in, we saw at least four houses with boarded up windows, and one with a rusty old car in the driveway. It started to make sense why the place was so cheap. I parked in the driveway of our place since there was no garage. When we got inside, it was pretty nice, especially on the inside. Everything was very clean and looked brand new, like a modern apartment or something. After we got settled, we decided to go for a walk. It was a long drive, and we needed to stretch our legs. It was just before nightfall, and there was still some light in the sky. The vibe of the street was creepy, and we didn't see many other people out. Looking at some of the older houses, I was sure that most of them were empty. We passed one house with boarded up windows and saw a city notice stuck to the front door. As we were passing it, a man stepped out from the side of the house and just stared at us. He looked about 40 or 50 years old, wearing a dirty red t-shirt and torn jeans. We didn't stop, just walked faster and made sure not to go back that way. It seemed like he was following us for a bit, but when I looked back, he was gone. Later that night around 11, we were back at the house finishing a movie in the living room. There was a window at the front of the cottage, which is where the living room was. We had the curtains drawn though. We were about to head to bed, and my girlfriend went to the bathroom. While waiting, I wandered over to the window and peeked through the curtains. I saw a group of three guys standing on the sidewalk, right in front of our place. One of them was the man with the red shirt we saw earlier. They seemed to be talking softly but then one of them looked straight at our window and pointed. I was nervous, so I called the Airbnb host to ask if there had been any issues in the area. The host answered and mentioned he was new to owning the house and didn't really know the neighbors. However, he suggested calling the police if we felt unsafe. I didn't want to overreact so we tried to sleep it off. The next morning, we had plans for some activities, but as soon as we stepped out the front door, we found that my car was gone. We were stuck in that sketchy neighborhood without a car, trying to figure out what to do next. We called the cops right away, and when they arrived, I showed them the house where I saw the man the day before. Obviously, I couldn't prove it was him, but he looked shady. When we got to that old house, the officer told me it was indeed abandoned and taken over by the city for unpaid taxes. It was in terrible shape, and no one could live there safely, so I had no idea what the man was doing hanging around there. After the police left, we called the owner to let him know what happened. We apologized profusely but we were both annoyed, not knowing we had signed up to stay in such a sketchy neighborhood. The owner must have bought that house cheap, fixed it up to look nice for Airbnb guests. From the pictures, no one would guess what they were getting into. He offered to refund us for the night and even paid for our bus ride back home, probably to avoid a bad review. Even still, I felt I had to leave an honest review about my experience. It wouldn't be fair to other guests if I didn't. I never found out what happened to my car, but I've been told that stolen cars like that are rarely recovered. Usually they're chopped up within hours, so it's probably not worth hoping I'll get it back. It took a whole year before I could save up enough to get a new car, because I wasn't making much back then. It was a huge setback for us, and it could have been avoided with a quick search on Google Maps. We didn't do that, and we paid the price.